Thank you very much, Giovanni, for the introduction and for inviting me to this exciting workshop. It's very uh, interesting and uh, very instructive. And yeah, today I'll, I'll be telling you a little bit about this work that we've been doing in the past couple of years. And as Giovanni mentioned, I, I, I used to be, you know, very recently at Purdue University. Now I joined UCSB and I had a starting group. And if you're a student or, or, or a researcher who is interested in joining, we're hiring. So uh, we just started a lab there. So I thought I'd mention that before I begin. Okay, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, this, you know, computing today, where things are, and, and not, not just from, you know, our community, the Spintronics community, but from a broader sense. And of course, you know, much of our computing is enabled and by the amazing, you know, uh, concept of a bit which is you know this this object that's either zero or one it's deterministic it is it is reliable it is robust and then a bit is a representation we can represent a bit you know many different ways and but most commonly we use transistors okay we represent bits by charges on a capacitor so we have these devices with you know billions of transistors in them and then you're seeing these new to, we've been you know hearing about new types of devices like gpus and cpus and and things like that. And on the other hand, you know, we've been hearing about quantum computing, which is, you know, based on this other object, this qubit, which is 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 difficult to explain. Even you know, I find it difficult to just say that it is, uh, it is a you know, it is zero and one at the same time because that would be correct. So it is this mysterious, very different thing. And there's a lot of activity here that you know by. We've been hearing about you know the Google experiment, Ion Q is making progress. So there's huge interest and 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 activity in this field with qubits. But one thing they, they look quite different. But one thing that I'll I'll call you know uh, your attention to about these two is that they're both doing something specific. Okay, so these are this is the era of you know domain specific hardware. We're not uh, talking about doing transistors better, so everything gets better. We choose applications and design devices to accelerate those applications. And you can see this happening in the space of bits as well. You can look at GPUs and TPUs, and these are not uh, general purpose computers. These are doing specific things for specific purposes. And one could argue quantum computing is very much uh, along these lines, that quantum computers are not meant to replace our digital computers, but rather they would be doing you know specialized things like simulating quantum mechanics. So today what I'll be talking to you about is also domain specific, okay? This idea of qubits, which will be also, you know, good for certain applications and not for general purpose computing. And um, so so the qubit the is somewhere in between, you know, the, the bit and qubit. So you can say that it is uh, a classical object, but it isn't entirely determined, you know, it, it isn't entirely classical either because it's got this randomness built into it, okay? It's this object that, you know, uh, uh, fluctuates between zero and one. And uh, I'll show you that it's got connections to machine learning and to this new era of quantum computers, which people call this noisy intermediate scale quantum, which is, you know, this idea that we don't have fault tolerance scale quantum computers. We have you know, only devices with, you know, maybe up to a hundred, qubits so what can we do with these with these computers so some of the applications that people talk about in that space is very much in the realm of things that probabilistic computing can tackle without you know the extreme requirements of hardware so it's interesting to talk about so so i'll give you a little bit of an you know wide application space for this for these uh, qubits you know if there's an easy way of expressing these things in terms of two classes okay and one of them is this optimization and the other is sampling uh, this is really uh, the, the most general thing that you can do with qubits, and that's it. And if you're you know, coming from a machine learning or statistics background, this means something. If you don't, let's just say that optimization is more like you know this quantum computing inspired stuff, where all these risk era computers are trying to you know uh, solve optimization problems. And in machine learning, you you hear this concept of sampling to to learn from statistical models. And in optimization. A couple of years ago, he came up with this idea of invertible logic, and 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 this I we later realized actually the next speaker, Professor Diventra, they they had been doing this before us. Okay, so just to be fair, but we called it invertible logic, and this idea is very interesting that you build a, a Boolean uh, a circuit like a multiplier, and then you can operate it in reverse. You can ask satisfiability questions like, okay, how do I uh, factor this number 
given that it's the multiplication of these two numbers. And I'll give you an example of that. And um, in other spaces, very large, this combinatorial optimization problems where you use, uh, for example, the famous example is the traveling salesman problem. Let's say you want to visit, you know, a thousand cities in you know, California. You start from, let's say, Santa Barbara and you want to you know, minimize this route. Uh, so how do you do that as long as you know, you're going to visit every city exactly once? So this type of problem is also very amenable to probabilistic primitives and building blocks because, you know, probabil probabilistic algorithms are one of the best in a large class of these um, combinatorial optimization problems. And, you know, there is this very interesting idea that, if, you know, if you hadn't heard of it before, it sounds almost unbelievable. But it's quite standard, actually, which is this idea of quantum Monte Carlo, which is, you know, there's a class of uh, quantum uh, algorithms like the transverse Ising model, for example, the entire uh, system that the D-Wave is using. They have very efficient and natural uh, uh, representations in terms of uh, a probabilistic object, all you have to do is to kind of have layers of the same thing. So it's almost like you pay a price for going from a qubit to, to a p-bit. So it's, it's like uh, 20 p-bits in, in this case co correspond to, to, to a um, qubit or something like that. So this is quite standard in software, but the, 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 the argument we made was you can accelerate these, these things you know, enormously if you go to hardware and directly use probabilistic things. And, you know, in machine learning, you have lots of, you know, you have no shortage of uh, statistical or probabilistic models. One famous one is this Bayesian networks, where you're trying to get correlations and inferences between probabilistic nodes, where there are parents and children, like uh, a previous speaker, Professor Bandavadia, talked about. So these things and Boltzmann machines, if you're especially trying to do learning, which tends to be a much more difficult task, can, you know, benefit from giving accelerated sampling uh, devices that can do this hardware. And, and so this is a wide application space for, for uh, these probabilistic bits and uh, things. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more detail how it works. So this p-bit, again, from you know, borrowing terms from the machine learning uh, uh, literature, it is a binary stochastic neuron. So what is a binary stochastic neuron? Well, you, the, the output is this object that can only become plus one and minus one. So it's quite discrete and digital. And then you have an analog input that controls the output probability of drawing a plus one or a minus one. Okay, so the way it works is you, if, if the input is zero, you draw the plus one and minus one, you know, with equal probability. And we usually think, think about this in terms of time, okay? That you know, as a function of time, you generate this bit stream. And if you sit and take an average, you'll get, you know, a 50-50 uh, uh, probability. And you can make it, you know, change this duty cycle of this uh, bit stream. You can make it more plus one than minus one. But note that this is, this is random and you always work with, you know, a plus one or a minus one. The average is really an added quantity. You're not gonna work with the average. And, you know, we can do things like you know, sweep this input from minus four to plus four, for example. And you can see that in the, in the middle, it becomes a noisy object and then it gets saturated. And, and, and if you sit at, at one of these points and take an average, then it looks like this uh, familiar hyperbolic tangent or the sigmoidal behavior. But as I said, this is a derived quantity that we're not going to uh, uh, use. It's not like you sit around and wait for 100 samples to, to resolve this hyperbolic tangent. That's an important thing. And, you know, we sometimes write this in, in this simple equation that basically reproduces the blue trace in the background. You're looking at the sign of a random number that's being compared to a uh, hyperbolic tangent input. And you can see that it really reproduces these figures here. So what about the P computer? How does the architecture of a P computer look like? Well, this was the building block. Well, the way you do it is you take an array of these things from one to N, and then you collect the uh, outputs of these objects. These are all digital outputs. And then you feed them back to one another. And, you know, the, the way you feed it back is, you know, one simplest, the, the simplest thing you can think of is to take a linear weighted average of these, these, these outputs. And so the JIJs here would be the weights of your network that would, you know, encode a problem. And then you feed it back to your uh, uh, inputs like this. And uh, those are those become analog numbers, even though even if you work with you know discrete weights and these these uh, the discrete outputs, that analog summation tends to be an analog number. So so uh, uh, you need a like a resistive you know crossbar network or some such thing to do this. But you know the interesting thing is that there is no clock in this system. This is almost an autonomous a collective system. 
So uh, it is clockless and it's quite interesting. And because it is clockless, the performance of this computer, you can show that it, the performance increases with increasing number of qubits. It becomes a massively parallel thing because the more qubits you put, a key metric that I'll describe later actually gets better. But there's one very important catch and that is you need to ensure that these qubits operate with up-to-date or informed on information. What that means is if you're too late in your feedback and you, for example, there are two things that are connected. If you switch and if you switch again before your connection is, you know, communicated to your neighbors, then you don't get this fundamental, you know, distribution that these things go to and that becomes a huge problem. So, uh, so this is the, this is the fast synapse requirement that, you know, the time it takes to generate a sample from your PBIT needs to be slower than uh, the, the time it takes for you to complete a round trip. Okay, so this is a very important hardware requirement that doesn't come up in software. So you won't find this in, in the you know, classic machine learning papers, but you immediately discover this when you're trying to solve, you know, put this on hardware. So, well, how do we build uh, pivots? Now, this is the sp where the spintronics connection comes in. And this is, uh, you can maybe guess already that the, you know, this is the building block we're trying to get. And the physics of the ferromagnet or the super paramagnet actually is, is, is very relevant. And, and usually, you know, the, the simplest way of thinking about a magnet is that you, know, you have a red state and a blue state and you separate those by <clears throat> an energy barrier. And usually people would say that, okay, there's an exponential uh, relationship like this, that there's a prefactor. And, and if your energy barrier is, let's say, 40 kT, then you're going to have a long retention time because, you know, if you use a picosecond for that prefactor, e to the 40 is some, I think, some number of years. And, and that's the you know, fundamental premise of our memory technology using magnets. Now, you know, this is not exactly correct, but I'll put it down anyway. If you make that energy barrier kT, then the same formula will say that, oh, look, now your retention time is picoseconds to nanoseconds. Now, the reason this isn't entirely correct is once you go to these low energies, there is really no red state and blue state. It becomes a much more broadened object. So, uh, but, 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 and, but I won't, you know, and the correct theory for this can be done, but I won't go to details on this. And uh, so it's just, just to show you that things can get very fast if you reduce the energy barrier, okay? So that's the, that's the idea. And this uh, in the audience doesn't, you know, need any introduction to the MTJ, but if you use a uh, free layer, uh, with one of these things, then you can get something like a resistance that's fluctuating as a function of time. Now, as I said, I'm not going to go into the magnet physics here, but this can be picoseconds to nanoseconds, which is actually quite surprising. And this was a theoretical thing until very recently. You know, we've been uh, talking about this for a number of years now, but very recently, Jonathan Sun's group and Krista Fransky from IBM, they you know, uploaded this paper and they've shown that uh, these magnets can actually uh, operate really, really fast. And this was just about a month ago. And please go ahead and check the paper if you're interested. Now, uh, let me uh, mention we, our other collaboration, which is, you know, this is uh, with, with, at Peru, we've had this collaboration with Tohoku University with uh, Professor uh, Shinsuke Fukami and Professor Hideo Ono's group, where we started with slow magnets because it's a proof of concept demonstration and because of this fast synapse requirement that I, I told you earlier that the magnets need a speed limit, we got these perpendicular MTJs. And you know, as you may know, that if you increase the thickness of the free layer in these PMA magnets, they become more and more unstable. And on the you know, top right, I'm showing you this, you know, as the, you know, they have this amazing control at Tohoku. You can see the you know, precision control here that makes the magnets faster and faster. And this is uh, some millisecond to microsecond fluctuations, which is right around in the ballpark for us to, uh, to, to, to work with them. So this is what we did. And, uh, but, 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 you know, this is the MTJs that we got from them. But the question is, you know, this is a fluctuating resistance. So how do you work with a fluctuating resistance? How do you go from that to the you know, uh, the input output characteristic that I showed. Well, that, that's, there's a very, you know, another fortunate accident here, which is the STT MRAM uh, technology, which uh, has now made amazing progress that they're talking about, you know, they're not talking about it. They have, they, they're, they're saying that they have manufactured ready one gigabit MRAM arrays. And um, so this is, this is quite amazing to see that how quickly that happened. But the basic cell there is this 
one, uh, one empty one transistor, one MTJ cell, and the pivot turns out can be can almost look exactly like that. You know, all you have to do uh, is to change one of those MTJs, make them unstable. For example, like making them thicker, like the Ono group did, and then add two more transistors, only two more transistors at the output to the drain, and then you have your <clears throat> input voltage. And then you have your output voltage. And then if you simulate this using your fairly detailed models like uh, stochastic Landau Lifshitz, and then you use like real transistor models like FinFETs, and it turns out you get this input output characteristics that looks pretty much like the binary stochastic neuron characteristics that, that, that we talk about. And you know, you can easily understand this behavior when the input voltage is you know, very high or very low, you cut the transistor off or you short this node to the, uh, to the drain. So that's why you see this um, saturation. The saturation comes from the transistor physics. Okay, this is something I'd like to you know, get across because sometimes you, know, you, you might think that the saturation comes from the pinning of the magnet. Not really, you know, it comes from really transistor being uh, dominating this and there's an inverter here. So that's what gives this thing the S shape. The uh, tra MTJ just gives you the uh, randomness that's, that's happening here. Okay, so this was simulation in 2017, but with Ono's and Fukami's MTJs, we actually you know, managed to get this behavior in, uh, in, in a uh, printed circuit board. So that's what you're seeing here. This is experimental data. And it's pretty much the same thing. We just stuck a resistor here to be able to control variations because the individual, because you know, variations of course might be uh, very important in, the, in these devices. And you're seeing this tunable stochasticity as a function of this input voltage of the transistor. And you can see that it's roughly always uh, 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 discrete plus one or minus one, in this case VDD or zero. And this is our chip that this is a PCB, this is two centimeters. So there's eight. MTJs here that are all discrete resistors that are wire bonded that came from Tohoku. And then we've built this PCB at Purdue. And this is really the same architecture I, I'd shown you earlier that, you know, it, it's really the same thing. And in this case, to make things simple and programmable, we use the microcontroller to be able to uh, control the weights and program the weights. Okay. And so what did we do with this computer? We took an algorithm. This is a natural annealer, a natural optimizer. And we took an algorithm from the field of AQC, adiabatic quantum computing. And, and this, is, this is a factorization algorithm, which, is, which says, okay, if you have two binary numbers, X and Y, and this is just binary uh, uh, weighted numbers, it's just you know, encoding numbers in binary. And then if you have a factor F, you say that you know, if I'm trying to minimize, if I have a factor F, if I can minimize X, Y minus F squared, the minimum of this energy will give me the factors. Why? Well, because when x, y is equal to f, you have a minimum and everything else is a higher energy, right? So, so this is a very you know, simple idea. It's very common uh, in optimization. And you can get your synaptic weights just by defining that energy function. And this is what we did. And, and, and we programmed this, this to our, to our uh, uh, microcontroller. And then you start in any experiment, you start from a clean uncorrelated state, get a clean you know, graphs of probabilities here uh, after, you know, a 10 second average when they are disconnected, okay? So this is your calibration step. And when you connect them, the average, you know, the 20 second average or so gives you the right answer for a given chosen factor with high probability. In this case, the chosen factor was 945 and in 10 or 20 seconds, it, it, it gets you the right, right factor with, with high probability, okay? So, so this is the idea and factorization, <clears throat> as I said, is completely incidental. You can minimize you know, a whole bunch of functions that does, does, that does this because the system naturally wants to go to the um, uh, a minima. And then of course, noise helps enormously because you don't get you know, this, this common wisdom that you, know, you don't get stuck in local minima. <clears throat> now I'd like to show you another example, which is you know, that factoring algorithm is good, but there's something more interesting. And this is through inverse multiplication. Okay, now this is a more algorithmic idea. Uh, uh, and, and the idea is you have a multiplier in, using Boolean gates. So you can build these AND gates and full adders out of these, these pivots. And because these are reciprocal undirected graphs, you can, you can run, run this thing in reverse. And you can ask the question, if I have the school book multiplier where there are like bitwise AND gates and full adders that you, know, you, you, you multiply, you add, you multiply, you add. This is our school book multiplication written in Boolean circuits. 
can you operate this in reverse? And it turns out this is a famous, and, and we'll use the same architecture. Okay? This is the architecture that we use. It's just that the weight and the topology of the network will change. And it turns out this is a famous problem in, in CS. That this is called the circuit sat problem. You know, people in CS don't think in terms of hardware, but they say that you know, they, they, they lay out these uh, Boolean gates and they ask these satisfiability questions. That what factor, you know, what input combination satisfies that output? And, and it turns out even the best SAT solvers actually get stuck in, in this is an extremely difficult problem. You can use, you know, the state of the art SAT solvers and you can't factor numbers that are, you know, you can't even factor RSA 100, which has been factored, you know, 20 years ago. So this is a, in turn, when, when formulated as a SAT problem, this is an extremely difficult problem. And in this case, uh, it allows a very sparse discrete modular weights. It, this, you can do this with just my, you know, these, these, uh, these weights that are only changing, you know, only a few values as you can see. And here's an example that, you know, fairly large number is a 14 bit number. And, and you can see that, you know, you can operate this thing in reverse and in 2,500 samples, you can factor this in a fairly large semi-prime uh, uh, using this, this PDID approach. And as I said, you know, the, the, there's algorithmic you know, difficulties here, but if these samples can be taken in nanoseconds or picoseconds with those very fast magnets, you can have enormous improvements in terms of prefactors to solve these very difficult uh, optimization problems. So these are my last two slides, and uh, I want to show you this device level comparison because anytime you know we, we you build this, these domain specific devices, the question that that needs to be answered, and maybe some some of you have been you know asking this question already, is how does it compare to existing technology? Because we've got good devices, so you have to look at it from two ways. One of them is the device, okay? So this is the MTJ-based device with the functionality of this tunable randomness. Now, um, how do you get that in, in CMOS? Well, in CMOS, this turns out to be a fairly expensive operation, okay? Because anytime you ask for random numbers that are uncorrelated, you need to build these you know, circuits. And the simplest one is this pseudo-random number generator, the LFSR. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a, you know, a shift register that shifts its values and then there's XORing involved because XOR tends to produce these random looking streams, but they're only random looking because, you know, they, they'll repeat themselves because, you know, CMOS is completely deterministic. And if you take a, you know, it, the 32-bit LFSR is fairly common in, in other, you know, probabilistic approaches. So if you take and design a trans, if you des we designed this 32-bit LFSR almost, you know, transistor by transistor, so you can account for, you know, there's 11 and 94 transistors in a, you know, highly optimized LFSR design. And you can see there's a, you know, enormous increase in area, the footprint, because we were doing the same thing with uh, uh, just three transistors and one NTJ, right? So, so in fact, this is just the LFSR, not even tunable. And, you know, the energy also increases with, with this, but this energy analysis is, is quite conservative. We didn't, you know, have, we couldn't include the clock power or the repeaters. A real LFSR would be much more expensive in terms of energy. Uh, that, that's what that's what we think because uh, this was a simple analysis. Now, uh, another thing is in probabilistic computing, this isn't so important, but it's important to to remind us that you know MTJ gives you at least supposedly true randomness, while these uh, pseudo randoms are repeat themselves. But as I said, for these types of applications, I haven't seen any. But uh, to be fair. PRNGs are not perfect fine. So, so this may not be too important. So final slide where I'd like to show you another thing that raised that performance. So the first thing that I mentioned that the performance increases with increasing is an important idea and it's got nothing to do with magnets, okay? About this synchronous uh, 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 connection. And so the key metric in a probabilistic emitter or a sampler, how many samples do you take? Uh, per second, okay? And how many times can you flip? Can your system flip? Because this is gonna start as a Markov chain and you're gonna have to flip that many, many times to, to, to get to a, a, a right uh, result. And uh, of course, remember that in hardware, there's this requirement that the synapse needs to be fast, but I won't uh, you know, get into that. I'll just assume that we'll arrange our connections and the fan out in such a way that we, we um, ensure that this happens. Then the, the next question people ask is, okay, how many times do I need to flip to solve a problem? Well, that's problem and algorithm dependent. 
Some problems are extremely easy. Some problems are extremely hard. But the you know, main message we're trying to give here is that we're going to improve the prefactor. Okay, so I don't, you know, your al the pro algorithmic problems that you have because it's a difficult optimization problem is a separate discussion that we, you know, that we can make. But if you have hardware that orders of magnitude faster, then it's going to be useful no matter what. So just to get you calibrated, if you look at highly optimized GPU and CPU codes on these Markov chains and samplers, 10 to the 12 flips per second seems to be the upper bound. And this is an amazing number if you sit down and calculate it because, you know, this is a thousand flips per clock cycle. So that's already highly optimized, but that seems to be the limit, you know, with many different implementations. Now, if you have a million p-bits, each, you know, each flipping with 100 picoseconds, and as I said, you know, based on this experimental demonstration, this is not far from truth. You can have, you know, n over tau, you can have 10 to the 16 flips per second. So it could be a much better annealer that, that works much, fa you know, much faster than uh, your GPU. And, and remember, this has nothing to do with magnet physics. It's just that you're asynchronously flipping and, and that turns to, to give you this massive parallelism. And uh, you may ask, okay, one gigabit MRAM is out there. So why not, want, you know, if, if you're making projections, why, not we, why don't we say like 10 to the 9 pivot? Well, if you design chips, you probably will you know, we'll probably face a power wall, area wall, interconnect wall. So, so one million is, is based on, you know, some thinking that maybe that, that can fit in, in, these, in these MPJ uh, chips. So this is the final conclusion slide. I talked about PBITs in terms of its connection to, you know, these various active fields that are, you know, that, that are trying to develop accelerators. Now, I've talked about MRAM and Spintronics in this talk, but we're actively seeking CMOS and FPGA implementations to accelerate these these uh, the, these concepts and maybe emerging hardware or other methods of you know getting randomness could also be used, and uh, th there is a possibility of beating classical computers because of this you know flips per second argument that I made, and uh, finally you know what types of problems or uh, uh, algorithms should we accelerate? Well, I think uh, the the keynote is look for naturally stochastic ones, and machine learning and optimization are full of examples. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and thank a, a long list of my collaborators and, and uh, colleagues, and uh, I'll take uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you.